Okay. What? Which one's that? <laughs> I've never had so much for so many for so long for so little. Haven't you met my goat, my newest ghost rider? <laughs> He's a walking bumper sticker. <laughs> Fred, well, who are you writing for? Which one are you? I'm stringing for UPI at this point. I see. Right. Between engagements. Do you have anything you need for real fast? Yeah, I'm good at dropping in. So we're looking at another one. You pick up a whole staff here, Chief. Everybody have their uh, tape recorders on. <clears throat> okay, <coughs> I think they're all running. Well, good afternoon, uh, gentlemen, and I'm delighted to welcome, as a distinguished visitor to St. Louis, the Secretary of Agriculture. Uh, he will address the NFO session tonight, as I understand it, and I'll give a speech uh, later on this afternoon. We're at your pleasure and at your disposal. Who's first? I'm aware of the NFO program, which is designed to provide a return to producers at a level which will enable them to continue to expand production to meet the needs of an increasingly hungry world. The fact of the matter is that since um, 1974, three quarters of the retail food cost increase is due to the added cost of convenience. And uh, the farmer's share out of that uh, retail dollar is, has declined. There has been a revolution in the food processing industry in the last 20 years. Consumers apparently prefer to have more foods processed in the factory and, of course, unfortunately, have to pay the price. The, um, there is only a, a um, remote resemblance between retail food prices and farm income. purchase of American farmland by foreign interests. This is a concern that's going on. I understand there are some public hearings going on in Washington. How far would you say that this whole proposition can go, foreign purchase of American farmland? We're not sure. And so uh, the new farm bill carries what we call the Eagleton Amendment, which requires that a survey be undertaken. And we're in the process of implementing that amendment. By the uh, first part of March, we will have uh, data from every one of the 3,000 counties in the United States reporting to me as to the extent of foreign ownership of farmland, and we in turn will report those findings to the Congress. At this time, you don't know, though, how much American farmland is owned by foreign interests. We do not know. No one knows. No state knows. There is no record kept in this regard, and uh, we are going to look at it and uh, find out whether anything should be done. Will you be able to weed through the hidden foreign interests? 
There are some of those accounts which are very difficult to establish clearly because they're purchased by American firms and it has been alleged in some cases that they're financed with foreign monies and there's no way we can really find that out. Senator Eagle, your reaction? Well, I think the Secretary summed it up very well. We honestly don't know the extent of purchasing. My suspicion is that it's it's a highly exaggerated. That is that, yes, there have, some, there have been some foreign purchasing of, of American agricultural land, but it, it by no means is a, a gigantic amount. But we ought to know, rather than me guessing or Secretary Berglund guessing, we want to know, and that's what the amendment was all about. Now, there, the, uh, there will be some pieces that we'll not be able to trace through straw parties and what have you that uh, appear on the surface to be 100 percent purebred American. But uh, by and large, I think we'll have a better picture of this uh, uh, in early spring or, or early summer. Mr. Secretary, gas haul is a hot item. What's the feasibility of Congress passing legislation ensuring farm commodities? Congress has already passed legislation in this regard. Uh, the last Farm Bill carried a, an amendment which uh, directs me, as Secretary of Agriculture, to explore the feasibility of converting uh, raw agricultural produce into usable forms of energy. We're now at the business of uh, examining 37 applications in this regard. We've approved one, which would uh, convert hardwood timber and hardwood products to uh, a liquid fuel. We are examining the matter of converting grain to alcohol. At the moment, it sounds as though that is uh, impractical because of cost. It appears as though uh, the um, $2 corn uh, would convert to about a dollar and twenty-five cents a gallon alcohol, and in today's market, that would be uneconomic. But we are going to examine the feasibility of converting city garbage, animal waste, straw, corn cobs, anything which today is a waste material, and see how much of this can be recovered in some usable energy form. Young farmers who bought land in 73 and 4 when grain prices were much higher than they are today found themselves in big trouble when grain prices fell sharply as they did two years ago and especially a double whammy if they were also engaged in the production of uh, livestock, particularly beef. To try to help them through that very, very trying period, we have a brand new FHA program to help finance them through these critical periods, recognizing, of course, that credit is no substitute for income. In the long run, I would say that the outlook is very good. The um, demand for American farm products in the international market is strong. <coughs> this year, the exports will break all records at a time when the world is producing the best crop in history. Prosperity is uh, developing over the entire world, and so the prospects are that we will continue to see strong demand. Now, the question is, at what price? And uh, I'm uh, urging farmers to be careful when they buy land and not get too much money in that land, because uh, there's no guarantee that they can pay it off if they pay much more than its uh, real value as an income earner. And so uh, this thing, I think, can be worked out, but it takes time, and people have to be careful. But the administration is making any assurances to the young farmers? Yes, we are. We're providing them with the necessary credits so they can buy land and um, rent land and get started. We're providing them with market opportunities overseas. We have developed a farmer-owned grain reserve program to avoid the boom and bust, which has decimated agriculture in the last seven, eight years, and it's working. Do you think this will also attract young people to go into farming? It will indeed. Uh, there were many who started in 73 and 4 and got wiped out in 75 and 6 because of the boom and bust policies of that period. Farming is a business, and I've talked with bankers who are reluctant to lend money to uh, young farmers if there, is n if there is a risk involved uh, beyond that which the far banker can assume. And so we need to develop strategies which tend to uh, get things settled down. Boom and bust is a disaster for young people. Mr. Secretary, along that same line, it's my understanding that last week you directed the Farmers Home Administration to try and not make loans to farmers for land at what would be considered artificially high prices. At least that's the way I saw it reported. 
What I would like to know is how the government determines whether or not a piece of land is artificially high priced and why that would be a price to get the We will look at the income capacity of that farm, the earning capacity of the land, look at the productivity of the soil, and all of the elements which uh, go into a, a judgment of this nature. And uh, we are not doing a young farmer any favor by making a loan so big that they can't pay it off, can't even pay the interest. Uh, so we're entering this thing in a way that would, uh, we think is prudent and provide young borrowers with some financial advice, which we all can use, of course. Is it also prudent then to make it available programs at very low interest rates as an inducement for farmers to try and buy land? We have a new program we call Limited Resource Lending Authority that we can set rates of interest down 2-3% for those people who have, at the moment, limited resources, but who have income earning potential. That program does, of course, systematically raise the rate of interest through and to commercial rates over a period of five years. And that's a new enterprise which we will use to help young people, particularly people in the, uh, in the small farm category. And um, I think it's going to be a big help. Mr. Secretary, what methods is the administration exploring to avoid the boom and bust cycle and its uh, bad effects on both farmers and consumers? We have created a farmer-owned grain reserve. We've financed now uh, 10 billion bushels of on-farm storage capacity. The program is working. We have farmers have joined up with 33 million tons of grain in that reserve. There's no one in this country that can forecast the uh, yields next year because of the weather factors. The yield of corn will be probably not less than 5 billion bushels and not more than 7. Now, we therefore need to get set for whatever takes place. We've had an, an excellent yield this year, 100 bushels an average uh, yield on corn, an all-time record high. The uh, soybeans and, the, uh, and all the crops, in fact, were good to excellent this year because of favorable growing conditions. Rather than cut the price down to rock bottom levels and try to sell off this crop, as has happened in the past in other uh, administrations, trying to get rid of the crop and then running into the next year with severe shortages, which has also happened, and I, we all have remember uh, memories of the embargoes during those periods, we've taken a different tack. We've said when we have good weather and good crops, let's store that excess on the farm. And when the demand is generated, either because of a short crop here at home or overseas, the farmers will own the grain supplies and can sell it to satisfy that demand. These kinds of programs will tend to end the horrendous boom and bust cycle that we saw in the earlier part of the 1970s. In addition to that, we are engaged in international negotiations to establish international uh, commodity agreements. We have one in sugar now in place. We are pressing for an international wheat agreement that again would look at wheat, for example, as an international commodity. And rather than having <coughs> prices of wheat at way below anybody's production level some, year, some years, uh, which discourages production naturally, and then have very high prices in other years, which discourages consumption, an international wheat agreement would establish a market corridor that would uh, approach wheat as a business and not as a gaming table. Can you summarize what message you're going to bring to the farmers tonight in your speech? I'm here primarily to learn. I'm going to uh, briefly uh, uh, highlight my recent trip to China. I have traveled the world over in market development activities, and I think our record speaks for itself in this regard. I'm here, though, to answer questions to the thousands of uh, delegates assembled here in St. Louis. And I do this as a matter of policy. I spend uh, one and two days a week around the country listening to what people have to say and answering their questions. Senator Eagleton, as uh, chairman of the uh, Subcommittee on Agriculture and Appropriation, uh, I assume that this year, again, we're looking at a Congress that is uh, being urged to make budget cuts. Uh, if you could, could you speculate on uh, 
whether or not this is going to hit the agricultural sector and if so, and possibly in what programs? I think this will be the tightest budget in modern history. And I think, as submitted by the President, and I think the congressional response to it will be tight itself. That is, that we'll <clears throat> bring in budget, we'll bring in figures at or below the President's uh, suggestions. Now, that means that a lot of worthwhile, respectable, decent programs, which in years in which uh, money might have been more abundantly available, just will uh, uh, <clears throat> be capped out this year. Uh, I think it's myself, speaking just for myself, it's very unlikely that we will uh, fund the so-called Culver program. And I'm a great believer in the Culver program. And uh, I think no Secretary Berglund thinks it has high promise, but uh, there isn't the money, I don't think, to begin upon it this year. Uh, this year's budget, uh, there were significant increases in research in a whole range of items, both the competitive grants that Secretary Berglund and I both like, as well as the more traditional uh, mechanisms through the land-grant colleges. I don't think there will be a commensurate percentage increase in this year's budget for research. We're not going to turn it back, but we will not have as generous an increase in that item this year as last. Uh, so conservation might be a cut there. And uh, not lavish, but something there would, would we're trying to pair off and we'll have to pair off. Uh, 50 million here, 20 million there, and to, to bring it in on target. I, and I don't, this isn't poking just at the agriculture budget. I think the same process will be done by other subcommittee chairmen, whether it's HUD, Senator Magnus and his HEW subcommittee, or Senator Stennis's defense subcommittee. All of us are going to share in this tight fisted process. Is it going to be a good Republican budget? Well, in other times, in other places, if, if uh, Richard Nixon had submitted it or Gerald Ford had submitted it, uh, some of us might have said it was uh, terribly stingy. Since it's a Democratic president that's going to submit it, it's in the cause of fiscal prudence. The Secretary, lettuce farmers, particularly in California, have encountered a new super bug that is destroying and might destroy half the lettuce crop, sending lettuce to $2 a head. How much help can uh, they expect from the Agriculture Department? I've just been made uh, aware of that uh, new menace. I will uh, get in touch with the appropriate officials in California and with our own entomologists and see what can be done to control the, this new pest. We have um, uh, increased our research into the so-called um, biological pest control. We are about to release a new bacteria which has promise in controlling the uh, cotton budworm. This We're exploring seems to be uh, immune to most common pesticides. That uh, unfortunately has taken place uh, over the years. Uh, we uh, used to use DDT as a major uh, insect control uh, and uh, in uh, over the years we've seen uh, insects develop an immunity to that uh, chemical. In many places, it's no longer effective. Now, we've abandoned DDT because of environmental hazards and risks, but these bugs do develop this immunity, and that's why we need to continue research in this area, not only in chemical control, and we do need chemicals, we need to use them carefully, but we must have them, and uh, increasing biological controls uh, to see what we can do without using chemicals. What do you find as you go across the country is the primary concern of most farmers? Doubts about the future, mostly, because they've been rocked by the past. The uh, cattle industry has been devastated. Uh, from 73 to 5, they lost, uh, we think, between 20 and 30 billion dollars in actual outright losses and had to pile up debts. The uh, grain business has alternated between boom and bust, booming prices in 73 and 4, disastrous prices in 75 and 6 and 7. And uh, farmers are uh, leery about the future, and we're, I think, uh, making some progress. Uh, we can show what we're doing and that things are settling down. The future is promising. Farm income this year is up from what had been uh, disaster levels uh, as recently as a year ago. And um, I have real optimism. Mr. Secretary, whatever happened to the farmer's strike? 
The um, you're talking about the uh, last winter when they were driving the tractors around. Whatever whatever came out of it. They went home mostly and planted. And I urged farmers to participate in the uh, government uh, set aside programs as a much more effective remedy than the ad hoc strike, uh, which was threatened by some. Let me point out to. I don't know. I would uh, suppose so. Um, I have visitors from across the country in my office and in my department literally every day. And I'm sure there will be uh, farmers in Washington this winter. Some will come by airplane and some will bring a tractor. Just so happens, coincidentally, today, December 14th, is the first anniversary of the AAM movement. And, and what has happened to it, says, as Mr. Lindecki, well, a lot of things have happened in the intervening year. Farm income is up $5 billion in the past year. There's been a $5 billion increase in our farm income. Beef prices are very, very attractive to cattlemen. Pork prices are very, very attractive to pork producers. Soybeans at $6.30 is an attractive price to, to soybean producers. Uh, wheat is up 60 cents. Today, uh, over what it was a year ago, it was uh, uh, 60 cents. It's, it's up about a 30 percent increase, I think, in, in that year. Corn, is, is the price is low, but it's still up 20 cents over it was a year ago today. So what happened to the farm strike was that, uh, thank God for the American farmer, the, the, their economic picture has improved mightily in the past year. Now, that's not, they're saying they're not on easy street. Not, nobody's going to try to mislead you and say that Everybody's coin and money in this business, but it's a considerable improvement. December 14, 1978 versus December 14, 1977. Uh, Mr. Secretary, uh, Dr. Leonard Haverkamp of Wilson and Company is a guest speaker at this convention. He made the point this morning that uh, in pushing exports, that the Japanese have an increase in demand for pork, and they're increasing their hog numbers in Japan. So he made the point that in pushing exports, it might be better to push one pound of pork rather than six pounds of corn to the Japanese. What do you think? I think it sounds like a good idea, but I'd have to look at the economics of it more carefully to see uh, whether it would be a paying proposition. Uh, I certainly wouldn't uh, stand in the way. Indeed, uh, the exports of livestock and livestock products uh, last year exceeded imports by $400 million. And I've traveled the world over, and I find in places like the Soviet Union, in Poland, in Hungary, in Italy, um, in, in China, and other places, a demand for purebred livestock produced in the United States for them to use as breeding stock in their uh, campaign to uh, improve their diets for their own people. And the United States is, a, uh, is, a, is one of the few countries in the world where they can come and buy this uh, high-quality uh, parent stock and we should be prepared to sell it to them. Indeed, we are. Mr. Secretary, can the NFO's goal of a 20% increase in farm income be realized within the Carter administration's uh, inflation guidelines? Or would the impact of would that kind of increase be to inflate No, it would not be. As a matter of fact, uh, their goal is to increase net farm income. And this can be achieved in two ways, uh, controlling costs, bringing production costs down, if that's possible. Farmers have suffered more from the ravaging impact of inflation than any economic group in the United States. Farm production costs have doubled in the last eight years. Farmers buy at uh, retail and sell at wholesale and pay the freight both ways. There's no way a farmer can absorb and pass on to the consumer the increased production costs. The farmer is required to eat that ex increase. and. Uh, the president's program to control inflation uh, will be of enormous importance and will result in an improvement in net farm income without any increase in the cost to the consumer. Is that about do it, folks? Fair enough? Okay. Fine. Thank you. Thank you very much. Going back to your room. No, no, I want to hear. No, I'm going to reach you. I'm going to reach you. Great. Listen.